Great. So I'll just real quickly um, introduce again. This is Lauren Sell at the OpenStack Foundation. And we're about to have David Bluestone from Clear Path Communications run through some research that they've been doing over the past couple of months regarding OpenStack and the OpenStack Foundation brand. Um, so with that, I will... And, and just to, to note, we are recording this. If you didn't hear the, the, the prompt, uh, just so everyone's aware. So we'll yeah. be able to share it with people that aren't able to attend. Yeah, thank you. Great. Well, with that, I will turn it over to David. Great. Uh, thank you, Lauren. Yeah. Um, I'm going to share my screen so everyone can see. Um, is this is this the wrong screen? Let's see here. Hold on one second. Yeah, I think it looks good. Yeah. Can you see my yes. screen? Yeah. Okay, great. Go. Um, fantastic. Joe, okay. Yes. Okay. Um, so thank you, Lauren. I can kick off and kind of give an overview of what we've done over the last uh, six weeks or so. Um, and I have about 20 to 20, 25 to present. Um, if people have questions, um, you know, I'll, I'll pause and I, I will certainly like would welcome people to to ask and clarifications or questions about any of these slides. But then I think the plan is to pass it back to Lauren and the Open Tech team um, for Q&A uh, at the end. So people will have opportunities to weigh in. Um, at the outset, let me explain a little bit about uh, my firm, uh, ClearPath, and the research we've done. Again, my name is David Bluestone. Uh, I am a principal found, founder of ClearPath. Um, we have been doing research in the tech space, open source space, uh, for five years now um, with a number of different clients from CNCF, Cloud Foundry, um, as well as some uh, of the larger companies, you know, tech platforms. Um, but we have a lot of experience working with foundations, and open source foundations specifically, on um, market trends, tr tech trends, and generally, you know, what the purposes of foundations are to our um, decision maker audience, IT decision maker audience. Um, so with that, I will go to the second slide, which is just um, letting you know what exactly uh, I'm basing this presentation on. Um, which is both quantitative and qualitative in nature. We did four focus groups, started off doing four focus groups, two in Seattle and two in Beijing. Um, we, our focus groups consisted of ops, uh, DevOps, sysadmins, and architects. Uh, all four roles were, um, were represented in these four focus groups. Um, we also conducted four in-depth interviews with open source influencers, uh, representatives from Baidu, uh, Google, Microsoft, and Tencent. With, based on the qualitative research, based on what we were seeing and hearing, um, kind of with that open-ended listening, we prepared a survey to, as Lauren said, um, test kind of open stack uh, technology and, and foundation brand positioning, as well as kind of where open stack and open source fits in the market. Uh, that survey was conducted uh, from the end of August um, to the beginning of September. Um, it's just over one, one responded over 500. Uh, we got an extra straggler in there, but it was an uh, N equals 500 sample. Uh, this is a global survey across 10 countries. Uh, I've listed them here in five languages. Um, and we weighted them to be evenly distributed across those three regions, uh, North America, Asia, and Europe. Um, and we consisted of roles uh, including ops and architects, dev, DevOps, IT managers, CICO, CIO, CTO, and line of business. You can see the percentages there in the breakdown. The goal, stepping back, the goal is we're trying to be broad. We're trying to broaden scope um, uh, and broaden scale so we have a real pulse of the market. Um, I'll go through a couple regional differences as I go to this slide, but it's very important to not just be um, focused on, you know, U.S. or focused on a specific country or a specific type of role. We're trying to get broad IT decision maker um, opinion. So if there are no questions, I will continue. So let me get straight into the key findings. You know, we, we kind of identified three big buckets based on the research um, for OpenStack specifically, but also, you know, more broadly about the market. First, um, OpenStack itself as a reputation is, is quite powerful. Um, it, it is known as being, you know, a very powerful tool, uh, very flexible, customizable, uh, and also, you know, quite frankly, slightly difficult to master. You know, it's a complex technology. Um, when compared to other 
um, players in the market, you know, open sex brand health is quite solid. It, it compares um, favorably to, to uh, all the other um, companies that we tested um, with a strong majority, uh, 60, um, 64%, giving it a favorable rating. Um, the more people know about open sex, the more they like it. I think this is important. Um, we, we tested awareness and then we cut uh, that favorability question by awareness. And you can see as people are more familiar with open sex, the more, the more they like it. Um, that is a sign of strong brand health because it means the more they know about you, um, you know, the stronger your value is to, to these respondents. Second, uh, so that's just a level set, right? We want to just see where we stand um, with the market. Second, you know, what is the foundation? Um, mean to people and both in terms of general, you know, what does an ideal foundation mean, but also open sex specifically. And we found this is something interesting. You know, we went into this research not knowing exactly what the response would say, like, where do they think about foundations? What do they think the role of foundations are? And here the, the data was unambiguous in that respondents, you know, look to foundations to curate projects. It's not to house all the projects not to be overly prescriptive, but it's to provide a curated path to help them navigate, you know, in this case, open source in infrastructure, but it's to navigate the technology. Um, you know, the projects themselves are what's more important than the activities of the foundation. So anything the foundation does to promote and um, improve the experience of the actual projects is what um, folks are looking for. Um, they don't necessarily think first about the foundation, it's all about are the foundations helping support the project that I care about and that I'm using to, you know, do my job? Um, the uh, the other, uh, you know, uh, point here is we tested the concept of open infrastructure. Um, this is something obviously that has been discussed in the context of the summit, discussed in the context of some of the um, project work uh, and the new project coming under the Open Tech Foundation uh, umbrella. Um, open infrastructure in and of itself is a very compelling idea. Uh, we heard this especially in the focus groups, um, but it's very uncertain of what it is. Um, you have to define it in order for it to have real meaning because otherwise people kind of pull uh, what they think. I think um, they, they commonly associate open infrastructure with open source infrastructure, open source technology infrastructure, uh, but it needs to be explicit. It needs to be kind of, um, we need to be out ahead of this to define it. Otherwise people can get confused. Uh, that being said, once it's discussed, once it's defined for them, it is a very compelling. Um, idea. Uh, we see and we tested the idea of potentially um, changing the uh, OpenStack Summit's name to be the Open Infrastructure Summit. Uh, I will show you the data, but it came back very positive um, in terms of people that, that brought in more people. Um, and lastly, we focus on open source as, as kind of a, a trend um, and a pattern in the market. And it is just very clear that open source is the spine, you know, and it is the foundation, um, not to, that's an uh, unfortunate choice of words, because it's the, it's the foundation of the foundation. No, it's the, it's the backbone of, of why people are looking to foundations like OpenStack, um, because it is the thing that, that unlocks their opportunities um, as users and as companies. And so the more OpenStack Foundation can articulate, you know, its vision for the future of open source, the more we're aligning, the more we are um, you know, very common uh, trope in, in my in, in public opinion is you know meet people where they are. The more we meet people where they are, is when we're kind of doubling down on open source and our vision for open source. So those are broad strokes. Um, the uh, I will go into the data the data that that underpins these kind of big findings, and then I'll wrap up with you know some observations. Yeah. Um, so first let's talk about the brand. I mentioned this before. Um, it's not that the foundation brand isn't relevant. It's just that uh, the respondents here, when we ask about awareness, they're just not um, as focused on the foundation as they are the technology. Um, and you can see here on the left side, uh, we ask, you know, this familiarity awareness question. And OpenStack as technology is slightly ahead, beyond the margin of error. I should, have, I should have mentioned the margin errors as more or less 4%. You can't technically calculate it because it's a panel study and we don't know the overall universe of ITDMs, but if you were to apply the same uh, margin error calculation as you would for any survey, you get about 4%. And you can see here, you add variance somewhat um, together, open stack of technology, you know, 59% um, say they're very or somewhat familiar with it, where the open stack foundation is more like 52%. That's beyond the, the margin of error. That suggests, you know, and also that's pretty good. You know, we're talking about majorities here. Um, 
when you ask, you know, in, in whether they did these in depth interviews, that's the first quote in yellow, or the um, or the focus group quote, you know, what do they say about when we're talking about open stack? And the bottom quote is about you have control, it's safe, you can customize everything, less constraints, less limitations. But the migration is very tough. That goes to my first point on the key finding side, which is, you know, open stack has a strong, powerful brand, um, but it is also known as for some interesting parts. Um, and then we, we, you know, the top quote you all can read, but I'll, I'll reiterate here that, you know, OpenStack was the beginning of the evolution towards corporate contributions to open source, in my estimation. Uh, that was the first time I saw large companies publicly dedicating large amounts of Delaware work to an ASIN project. So it's known. These are what people think of when we're talking about OpenStack. Um, you know, I, I think, again, some of the things we heard about how you kind of, what the requirements are to, to use it as, a, to unlock the power and the promise of OpenStack is, you know, you have to raise or keep a technical team to, to keep development going, or you need to like, you better know your stuff. This is common. Um, so that is, you know, I think it's a good place because people know who, who or what OpenStack is, or they know more or less that there's a foundation around it. Um, and it has very clear positive and, you know, also that difficult to use um, part of its brand. If you go to the next slide, or if I go to the next slide, <laughs> sorry. Um, I, we do some favorability ratings. This is very common. You know, the way that we ask it here, where you ask about intensity, very favorable, and then we have the top number is overall favorability. The bottom number, just because we, a lot of these um, companies don't engender strong negative opinions, we group together kind of unfavorable and neutral and never heard. It's like everything is not just a positive opinion. Um, so that's why I have a kind of um, the pattern covered there, because most of these are driven by neutral or never heard. Um, but still, I, what, I, what I think is the takeaway from this slide is that OpenStack right there is, is 67% favorable overall, 33% um, very favorable, and that's in line with the other players here. You know, Google Platform is slightly ahead of everyone, um, and then most of the folks we talked to, uh, then Azure, um, OpenStack, Red Hat, uh, AWS, um, and then Rackspace, all kind of within the margin of error. Um, the, you know, we, we also um, we also said that some other companies not represented on here, uh, including Ali Cloud, Baidu, Huawei, uh, Tencent. Um, they have higher neutrals, which push down their overall favorability. But um, but in general, I think you know our main point here is that OpenStack certainly uh, has positive capability, and it's in line with all the other um, the other uh, companies in the in the space. Um, Possibly, what I think is, is even more interesting is when you kind of look at this, like I said at the outset, um, by favorability, you know, you look at, you cut this by very and somewhat favorable versus just a little and not favorable, and you see almost a 20% swing. So the more, again, I, I've said this now several times, so the more people know about open stack, the more they like it. 91% is quite strong. Um, we also broke this down by region, and you can see open stack has particularly strong favorability ratings in um, Asia. Uh, that's driven by China, which has 82% favorable, um, and then U.S. Uh, is also disproportionately favorable um, relative to North America, but also relative to the overall population at 67, 69% favorability. Uh, we also broke this down by uh, ITDM role, um, where CIOs, CTOs actually have a higher favorability than um, overall, with 75%. Um, the other roles are on average. Um, the IT managers get a 68% slightly above, and then the DevOps, Devs, and Ops all get a 68%, which is slightly below. Um, and lastly, we did do by company size as well, and you see our enterprise likes open stack more than enterprise, 71% favorability to 65. So some of these cuts we offer just to show you, you know, that it's not beyond, below the top line number. There are some differences, and that's why it's important to kind of get a, a broad scope of this research. Um, I think to me, the, the big takeaways from this slide is, you know, OpenStack is disproportionately seen favorably in Asia and, you know, amongst people who know it. Um, so the more OpenStack can do to get its name out there and to get its familiarity up, uh, the, the more positive feedback benefits, uh, the positive feedback loop that you receive from that. And then obviously Asia is a very important market and um, a market that's very receptive. Going to the next slide. We did ask um, some terms, you know, we asked statements, you know, what do you like? Um, what is, how compelling um, is it a reason to use OpenStack? So we kind of, these are in political terms, like the proof points, the biographical statements, and you want to see what pops. Um, here, you know, this is not all of the statements 
Um, these are the top statements we, we asked others. Uh, and I want to point out, you know, first, a lot within the margin of error there. That's why we had to include so many. It's like the top uh, proof points. Um, but, you know, what is, what is, what bubbles up? It's about the community, the numbers, you know, that's the first one. Um, we also have intensity here. We give this on a scale of zero to five. So the fives are dark red and the fours um, red are represented by light red. And the last number is the uh, total of both. Um, you can see some intensity around the partner, you know, the members. Um, that's a good third party credibility point. Those two are also in your top. Um, the less compelling statements, just as a point of comparison, so what didn't make this top list? It was about kind of like how the foundation started. Um, it was using the narrow case studies. I think we asked uh, a narrow case study around a couple of the members and how they're using OpenStack. Those, um, those messages didn't do as well. They were actually 50 or below in terms of overall compelling um, to, to use a reason to use OpenStack. Uh, from the data, from the quality of the data, it feels like it's not as relevant when you get more narrow um, around these specific cases and when you talk more about the foundation than the actual technology. But when you're talking about the community, when you're talking about the people backing it, which I think is another way of talking about the community, and this, uh, the, the actual value item about the speed and flexibility and lower costs, those are the ones that bubble up. Those are the statements that matter. So if the previous slide said the more people know about OpenStack, the more they like OpenStack, then these would be the things you'd want to convey to help people know more. Moving to the next section. So what, what is the role? So we talked a lot about OpenStack as a tool and, and, and the brand health of OpenStack as a technology. Um, but what about the foundation itself? And, and what's the expectations around foundations for open source generally and in OpenStack specifically? Um, here, you know, first, let's level, again, you know, are foundations a good thing or a bad thing? And overwhelmingly, people say that open source projects benefit from being adopted by a foundation, 70%. Um, you know, that is, anytime you get kind of big spreads like that, it's just a no-brainer. Um, only 4% say that they strongly believe that open source innovations are hurt by being adopted from, uh, by a foundation. So you're really talking about um, foundations being a good thing for open source. Um, on the right side, I think the statement here, this is a forced choice. So we, you know, we basically force our participants to say one or the other, and, they, and then we offer them kind of, um, they can volunteer, don't know, they can volunteer both. But you can see most people tend to get put into these buckets um, as a forced choice in our methodology. Um, and you can see here, you know, almost 60-40 say that the best model for an open source foundation is one that selectively works on projects and makes it easier to use, right? So this idea of curation. Um, I want to emphasize that because you know, that I think we went into this research without knowing um, the answer was, it's, you know, the, the, the other option was that it's a, it's one that brings in a large number of projects, some, I mean, some will succeed, some won't, and it just continues to support all the projects. Uh, there are open source foundations that kind of more fit the bill for either one, and we had genuinely um, no sense of, we had hypotheses of that this would be a dividing line, uh, but the fact that, you know, it's almost 60-40 in favor of kind of being more selective, um, being more of a curating, um, entity that curates, you know, how these projects work and how to make them better. I think that's a big finding. Um, and below, you know, I, I want to get some context on this quote, but, um, you know, this influencer said, I don't think we want just a single foundation. We want foundations to be focused on a particular thing. So it's not about just one foundation to rule them all that owns um, all the projects and some work and some don't. It's about just a more purposeful, it's about a more selective and more um, proactive foundation that kind of focuses on the thing that they do and then making sure that they support it with the projects. Um, and, I, you know, quite frankly, I, I do think that's interesting because it wasn't a foregone conclusion. Um, you know, again, we, 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 we asked this not only in the quantitative, but in the qualitative, and three out of our four kind of influencer um, also said that that second model of curation was, um, was their pre preference. Which is, you know, the me the metric we want to unlock, right? We want to un we want to be the type of we we would recommend, you know, open source foundation tries to be the foundation that um, resonates in terms of like what people are looking for the ideal foundation. So that is that did come through. Um, going to the next slide, we also ask about, you know, the ideal characteristics and apologies. My PDF kind of I think got a little wonky in formatting on the right side, but um, you can see here there's a very broad uh, sense of, you know, types of the primary role of a good open source foundation. I think it's muddled. Again, this gets to the idea that any foundation needs to be very clear and articulate its vision very clearly because um, 
what's expected of them uh, is a little muddled. It's a little fuzzy. Anytime you see, uh, you know, basically from 14 to 10, that's all within the margin of error. So it's kind of people want open source uh, foundations to set standards. That's the number one. Um, and then it's just muddled in terms of, you know, how do they do that? So I, again, just setting, um, being very deliberate and setting the course and setting a vision. And that's obviously the folks on this phone call, on this conference call are part of that, um, setting that roadmap. But that is what is necessary to cut through. Otherwise, it gets very fuzzy. Um, you know, moving to the left side, we also ask these questions qualitatively. And there you're able to kind of ask the why. In surveys, you're only, you know, you have one shot. You ask a question and if you get muddled responses, you're finding it's like people don't quite know. But for qualitative, you can say, so why? Or you ask the follow-up. And so we did ask that follow-up. Okay, so like what exactly are these ideas and characteristics? And when people kind of listed a bunch, we said, okay, well, what if you were to focus on a particular one? And um, four came out that we saw consistently across both the focus groups and the um, IDIs. Uh, the first one being narrow the choices you know, to, to lend credibility about which projects matter. So again, this, this, is, this is the why for curation, or this is, you know, putting some granularity behind this idea of curation. It's, what does that mean? It means narrowing the, all, you know, right now, tech, tech, this space is overwhelming in terms of how much is coming at people. Um, so being able to narrow the choices and, and then put your stamp of credibility on the projects that matter. Um, you know, make your project portfolio cohesive, make, again, aligned behind one vision. That people are looking for, you know, someone to make order and logic out of um, a lot of change. Um, this creating standards came through both in the qualitative and the quantitative. Um, so you can see that there is number three. And then, you know, be the, you know, provide the support and the visibility to help the projects that matter thrive. Um, I'll stop there. I, I heard some, maybe someone yeah. just got on some mute, but question, is there a question? Yeah, good yeah. question methodology here. Um, you asked yes. uh, all of these uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine questions, and you let the yes. person select one. Is that correct? Yes. And so, um, you know, quick math obviously shows you that we didn't get uh, that doesn't equal 100 because you want to select one, but then we also have people say they don't know, and I didn't include that number. But yeah, there's also people that that is part of partly why I say there's muddle because you had a lot of people also reporting don't know. Um, what the primary role would be. Uh, but yes, this is a select one. Um, we offered these options and we forced them to choose a single option. Um, potentially, this would have been different if we said select all. <laughs> we were actually forcing them to choose because we wanted to get them more, uh, we wanted them to trust their preference. And I think a select all would have maybe created more muddled uh, sense of things. Um, but yes, that was, our, that was the way that we set up the question. Great, thanks. So it looks kind of all over nope. the place. I guess people- Yeah, to... I mean that, we we tried to set it up by doing the select one um, in order to create a little bit more stri uh, stratification in here in terms of the responses, but you can still see here it is quite muddled, and um, uh, and 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 that that means again you know like in the qualitative we can ask well what do you mean or what you know what's the most important we can do the follow ups but in the survey you get this kind of muddled fuzziness, which means it's up to foundations to really make their case and to articulate their vision. Um, but yeah, uh, sometimes the, the results are things are fuzzy and things aren't clear. Sometimes, you know, when you get that 70% that open source um, benefits from foundations, that's a very clear result. Uh, this one would be one of the more fuzzy results. Uh, I will continue. And please, anyone who has questions, just jump in. Um, it's obviously, uh, I don't want to, if you have something lingering, I would like everyone to just feel comfortable to just ask. Um, let me go to the next slide. Um, so, we did ask, we then, you know, asked about this specific later in the survey, right? So we asked a bunch of questions around general, what do you want from my foundation? What's the ideal foundation? And at the very end of the survey, we, we, we um, design our research so that it's, you know, on kind of a, um, a inverse triangle where we start broadly and then we get specific also so that we don't um, cover any of the responses at, at the outset. And so our last section was very specifically around open uh, stack. And we did ask about specific projects. And here, you know, I think it's brought in broad stroke. Um, you have, uh, you know, all over 50% in terms of definitely or probably consider. That's a good thing. You know, like all of these projects when given a short, and obviously you can't give, um, you know, the detail that probably these warrant, but when given a short explanation, um, all of these generally, the majorities, and strong majorities, 58 to 68%. 
um, like these or, or would consider these projects. I think it's worth mentioning that, you know, the original project, OpenStack, is still leading the way. That has both the most intensity, definitely consider, and the most overall kind of positive would consider, definitely or probably. So it's, you know, always worth mentioning that the other projects are useful in terms of, you know, curating and creating a better user experience, but, you know, the OpenStack project, the original OpenStack project, is going to be the driver. It's, it's the thing that brings people to the table. Um, I think what's interesting here is that um, that there are majorities who would consider um, the other projects that are not considering open sex. So you are bringing people in um, that are not necessarily um, only thinking about open sex, right? So when we did crosses at these folks, uh, folks who would consider maybe Zool or Charming X or Kata, um, and you cross that with uh, people who would consider open sex, it wasn't one to one. It wasn't, um, I guess, a better analogy. It wasn't like a rectangle square. Not everyone who would consider open tech would be considering um, the other projects and vice versa. So you are bringing new folks to the table, um, which I think is, is, is an important and probably one of the motivations I would imagine around your all's um, decision to kind of bring in new projects. Um, uh, in terms of just a methodological point, I would, you know, basically say the takeaway here for me is open stack is ahead of the rest, um, but the rest are always in the margin of error. So, um, you know, my, Statistics background would just, you know, I wouldn't, you know, say, oh, everyone has to start doing, you know, focusing on Zool more than Airship. I, I would just consider that 60 to 58 percent is all within the margin of error. It's a step change, though, below open size, um, original project. Um, so, with that context around, you know, this idea that you can actually, folks would consider these other projects. Um, who are not necessarily saying that they consider open stack, right? The fact it wasn't one to one. We did test, you know, what about if you named a bunch of different summits and we put in as a, as you know, this doesn't exist yet, but open infra infrastructure summit as a potential name for a summit, you know, what would you find appealing? Um, and you can see here that uh, the, you know, that open infrastructure summit, this idea of possibly changing the open stack summit to open infrastructure summit actually is almost double um, in terms of how appealing it is. You're bringing in other people. Um, I would know, and this is with a fairly crazy response, so I want to just, you know, I triple, triple check the data. 56% of Chinese respondents say they'd be interested in open infrastructure summit to just 17% open stack summit. And remember that China is one of our biggest drivers with the capability of open stack. So, you know, you're not losing, um, you're not losing, you know, our core, our base in China. In fact, I think this might bring more people to the table. And if there's a way to kind of marry these two ideas where it's, you know, open infrastructure uh, summit brought to you by OpenStack, that would doubly um, appeal to the Chinese market. But um, I did want to just flag that because that's a big number, 56% of Chinese respondents. So they'd be interested. That was second, I think, behind um, I think it was by Microsoft, 57%. Obviously, there was inflated numbers across the board. But the fact that OpenStack Summit itself for um, those Chinese respondents was only 17%. So there's real opportunity here. Um, so again, this is about signaling. It's about signaling you know, that vision, that articulated vision. And we included this uh, quote on the right, um, which kind of puts a, a, a finer point to, to what the data shows, which is I think you're in very early days of the final open infrastructure. Um, and you have to explain why and what it means. Doing that will have to be throughout the messaging of the summit. That's what an open a source influencer says. So this is in line, this would support that. You know, folks are ready to hear about open infrastructure summit um, and it's possibly a way to signal um, kind of this vision uh, that OpenStack Foundation is bringing to the table. Um, moving to the last section here about open source, right? So what is that vision? And what is, what underpins the vision of OpenStack Foundation, well, open source clearly is uh, a North Star that Open uh, Stack Foundation um, needs to double down on, triple down on. Again, you have one of these giant spreads where 68% say open source mission is important to me versus 30% say it's not important to me. I mean, that's over two to one. But clearly, open source is, um, is important. And uh, I think also interestingly enough, open source technology is more innovative versus proprietary technology is more, again, almost two to one. Um, so open source is a good, it is a good thing to um, wrap uh, OpenStack and OpenStack Foundation up with. Um, if you take these same statements and you cut capability uh, by you know, people who think open source technology is more innovative and open source mission is important, you have massive uh, differences in terms of uh, people who like OpenStack. So this is part of the story. This is part of the brand. Um, 
um, you know, here's a, a, a focus participant uh, from Seattle that said, when you look at the open source community, there's options out there, there's like 25 different ways, maybe you do one thing, uh, but there's more and more released every day, right? So there's a lot out there um, in the open source community and people think it's important and that it's innovative. Uh, again, and this is across regions, across the world. Sometimes, and I would put out there, it's, it's like different um, regions felt differently, uh, I would definitely, you know, voice it, but this was uniform across, uh, across these different roles. Um, we also, you know, okay, so open source is important, open source is innovative, but it's useful, again, to meet people where they are by talking about why, you know, what are the benefits and what are the challenges? We have to solve the challenges, maybe through projects, maybe through IOC, SI engagement with, you know, end users, and we have to, you know, remind folks and always emphasize the benefits. And here you see two things. One, um, flexibility is the top benefit in security. I think security always tops both. This is one of the fun things about being a researcher in this field is you can always rely on security being in your top three, both in positives and negatives for any types of questions because it's just such a existential threat. Um, but flexibility um, pops. So that is something that's useful to uh, always have in our head. Um, the uh, other thing here that comes out as kind of a second tier benefits is just easy to use and most innovative. Uh, so that's kind of po the positive brand association. I do want to throw the positive um, motivation behind open source. I do want to flag here, avoiding vendor lock-in is a little lower um, than we were anticipating at 16%. I think this has a little bit to do with the question design. Um, vendors using open source technology in production. Uh, it's not just about open source as a concept, which people say open source is free or open source is you know, avoiding vendor lock-in, but using it in production, I think, is more technical. Um, we want to be more technical in this survey uh, than just kind of more broad-based. So, that would be a, my hypothesis for why vendor locking kind of is a little bit lower down the benefit. Uh, in terms of drawbacks, this inconsistent standards. So if we saw before that open source, the ideal role of an open source um, foundation is to set standards, we see why. Because when people look at the drawbacks of open source, this inconsistency of standards is a top concern. Uh, again, you know, the other concerns that came through is if, uh, if you add up those two integration um, questions, that also would elevate that to um, a top of certain 29%. Difficulty of integration with the environment and difficulty of integration with other um, source, uh, open source technology. Um, you know, again, um, when we ask, you know, we asked our savings there about which is more secure, 61% say proprietary technology is more secure. Um, compared to 37% say open source. So that's just another, another data point for why the security issue is at the top. Um, but, but uh, you know, again, if we think that open source is our North Star, then like it's worth, you know, always emphasizing the benefits and why it's valuable, why it's useful, why this is the right, um, this, is the, this is the future and this would deliver the best experience to users. And also speak um, and try to assuage any concerns. Um, you know, we also asked, and, and again, we have one of these big splits, uh, you know, same 66-31, it's a similar two-to-one split, which is, you know, well, why, what do open source technologies um, do related to my business? You know, and 66%, two-thirds say it allows me to um, focus on building features that matter to my company versus it requires too much maintenance and causes more problems than it solves. So again, you know, it's, it's seen as, it's, as something that can unlock value. Um, it's increasing productivity, it's adding value. And, um, you know, the fact is, we also asked about whether open source solutions integrate with their, easily with their current environment. And 57%, so it's slightly smaller, but still majority say that they integrate easily. But um, when you look at intensity, almost three quarters of that 57% were like, it's somewhat, somewhat easily, not strongly easily. So this, again, is an area we saw before in the, in the previous slide that a concern is this integration piece. And, you know, when you ask about integration, people feel like, yeah, it integrates easily, but it's not like I feel strongly towards that. I feel somewhat, it's somewhat easy. Um, so I think that's um, a, another data point to, for, you know, why they're looking towards new projects to help, you know, basically create better solutions for them. Um, now, I, you know, I want to focus the next slide here on, you know, what exactly, when we talk about open source, what exactly are companies doing with open source? You can see here on the left side, you know, the approximate percentage of companies' applications are developed using open source. It's a fairly large spread. Um, not a, you know, most of the people are, are, are doing 50% or less of their applications developed using open source technology, 
we know that people think it's important. We know that people think that it's innovative. Uh, so there's still room to grow here um, and move those percentages up. Um, it's right now about 50-50, uh, people who develop above or below 50% of their uh, applications using open source technology. We also asked about their contribution. About 75% say that they contribute to open source projects, only 17% say entire projects. A plurality is just code, and then you know a quarter say they contribute um, comments or questions in forums, and that's, uh, we assume, forums like Stack Overflow and, and whatnot. Um, and then, you know, we also ask, okay, is, is this increasing in importance or not? And that's just unambiguous. 81% say it's increasing. Uh, it will increase uh, in importance in their company. 27% much more important um, in the next few years. And a majority say it's somewhat more important. So this is, um, this is, this is uh, unambiguous here. That people are trying to contribute, that uh, a very strong majority say it's going to be more important over the next two, um, few years. And that leads me again to that left graph, the left side graph which is we need to probably anticipate and also encourage um, people, mo you know, that shift up. We should see those blue bars kind of moving up the scale because, you know, open source will only become more and more important. Um, you know, again, looking at the uh, breakdowns by region, I wanted to flag the Chinese market. Again, it's very important to, to, to open source, or sorry, to open stack um, that they, you know, 37% um, versus 20%, so beyond the margin of error, say that open source tech is going to be very important, and then 55% say open source is somewhat important. So in China, in a, you know, an area that we know is, uh, is fundamental to open source, uh, open sex market, you know, this is even more pronounced. Um, you know, if you add that together, we're over 90%, 92%. Who uh, say open source is going to get much or somewhat more important in the future. Uh, so I want to end um, just with some strategic openings that we see from this research. So, so up until this point, um, my intention was just to report kind of the facts on the ground um, to give you all a pulse of the market um, across geographies, across different roles. Uh, the next, the final four slides are intended to kind of, you know, spotlight different openings that we see um, for you all to, to make decisions around um, regarding uh, Open Stack Foundation. So the first one here is, you know, open infrastructure is appealing. Um, it could be useful, but it's not well defined. Um, and so it needs, you know, I, I know a strategic opening would be for the Open Stack Foundation to be uh, very deliberate and, and, and out in front in terms of defining this as a useful tool. So, um, as I said before, this is this actually came after we asked um, about the name Open Source Summit uh, and versus Open Stack Summit. We then, you know, later in the survey, at, you know, gave them a definition of open infrastructure, and then asked. Obviously, we didn't want to do the definition before because we didn't want to bias those results. We wanted to have that be a clean read, as if someone was just seeing advertising, digital advertising, or someone heard from their boss about this summit. We wanted that to be a clean read. But then we ended up like defining it and seeing, okay, well, is this useful to your workflow? And here you see a very strong majority. You know, over 70% um, say that 72% say that it, yes, it, it, this would be very useful or somewhat useful. So already we have, um, you know, what we think is like this is a compelling idea. Uh, we then took just the quarter and said yes, very useful. These are you know what we call like the lowest hanging fruits, and we said okay, but you know what, <laughs> what are the following phrases that you use to describe open source? These are people who say yes, open source should be very useful to my workflow. And then we said, okay, we'll describe it. You know, which of these phrases describe it? Again, very similar, select one, just like the other one. And you see, okay, open infrastructure built from open source components. That's about, you know, a third. That's good. But then 41%, you know, plurality kind of has it a very, you know, confused definition. Shared infrastructure, IT infrastructure, infrastructure based on some contributions of these big companies, physical infrastructure like ride share, um, you know, in the focus groups, we heard people talk about um, the uh, the bike ride share. They were actually talking about actual open infrastructure. Um, so there is this, and then a three percent say outdoor physical infrastructure. I believe in China, we heard someone say it was like an outdoor bathroom, like actual infrastructure that is outdoors. Um, again, the term needs to be defined. It's compelling when it's given when we have a definition, but um, you know, still, even people who say it's compelling need to be taught. There's an education component here. Um, you move to the next slide. You know, again, I've showed this slide before, but I want to emphasize it. Um, just that, that that point that I made earlier that you know about one in two participants who consider adopting uh, OpenStack 
um, would definitely consider adopting one of the other projects. But that also means that, that you know, uh, about half would not. So again, these new projects has the potential to attract new users. And if it's under the common, you know, kind of theme or the um, cohesive narrative vision of open infrastructure, then maybe that's a way to bring uh, new users into the community. Um, and you know, this this might suggest why the summit um, isn't is an opening here strategically to to kind of bring those folks in because you can say you know it's it's open stack first and foremost, but it has these other projects to make your experience using open infrastructure <laughs> smoother, easier. Uh, and, and more productive. Um, we also um, did kind of a market uh, a market assessment or uh, just about market trends and technology trends that are on the horizon. This is a question we've used in other studies um, as well. We find it very predictive. Um, you can see here, uh, private cloud, uh, about 62% say they're currently using it. Another 28% say that they might plan to use them. I mean, private cloud is obviously going to be the biggest technology here out of the ones we tested. But then you see um, some other uh, types of technologies that have very strong, you know, um, planning on using numbers. Uh, and these are coinciding with, you know, some of the special focus areas uh, that Open Tech Foundation has, has been thinking about. Um, you know, the top uh, plan to use in the next 12 months um, is network uh, functions virtualization and edge computing. Um, you know, but but short, uh, you know, right behind there, containers, um, CI/CD, 26% uh, planning in the next year. Um, so we see, you know, these are maybe not currently using, but they're certainly in the pipeline, and it's useful to um, to get out in front of these things and to uh, have an explicit offer around how, when these technologies become integrated into their current workflow, uh, they will. Um, that there's, there's there's a solution for those, and there's a way to use those technologies that are on the cusp uh, or on on the in the pipeline of these companies um, by using them in their environments, open source infrastructure environments. If you move to the last slide, we, we did um, we I've been talking uh, a lot about articulating a vision, and we did test some vision statements. This was at the very end of the survey. This is so it didn't bias anything else before it. Uh, but we did say, okay, we want to end with some statements from the Open Stack Foundation about its mission. Um, and here were the top three. Uh, we tested, I think, six, six, maybe even eight. Um, I, that's an that's a embarrassing oversight. I should know that. I think we tested six um, total statements, but these are the top three, and we focused on these top three because they were all up over 60% in terms of much and somewhat more favorable. The rest were in the low 50s, so a significant, you know, beyond the margin of error. Uh, difference and the first one, uh, the first message I want to point out, um, and all of these are within the margin of error. This, what I want to you know, emphasize, this was a step change above uh, the other statement. So we want to just focus on these, and it all kind of together tells a, a story. Um, one is, you know, that Open Tech Foundation's, in, you know, its mission is to increasingly support this open source uh, IT infrastructure. Right? It's using, that's uh, it, it, built by the community. It's following use cases wherever they are, it's single cloud, multi-cloud, enterprise data center, but like its goal is to ensure that IT infrastructure is more and more open source. We know open source is important, and this is kind of a nice way to double down on that or tap into that. Uh, the second one is about this curation, right? So, so it's nice when you see in a survey multiple data points that support a similar conclusion. And so our second strongest message was, you know, that open source foundation, um, its aim is to um, help people who build open source work together to build solutions for any modern stack they can find curated project they trust so again you're seeing that concept come through uh and the statement pair earlier in the presentation suggested the same uh and last it's about um the last the, the, the third strongest message um was about filling the gaps and here you see tapping into some of the special focus areas things that people know are coming down the pipe pipeline um, from container architecture, edge computing, CI, CD, data center infrastructure. You know, it's about filling the gaps in open source infrastructure by advancing, you know, solutions and projects to, to have a better user experience. All these things, I think, could be said in a cohesive way to articulate a vision about why Open Source Foundation is doing what it's doing um, to both, you know, make the open source experience better for end users, um, but also specifically around, um, specifically around the projects that it has um, that it's, it's focusing on to, 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 to fill the gaps and to be highly curated 
in, in its selection of those projects. Um, so to conclude, uh, I'll restate kind of the key findings and then, you know, finish with the street openings and open to questions. Um, I'm right around my time. Uh, and so we have about 10 minutes to, to, for you all to ask questions and for open stack folks to, to kind of, um, take their takeaways, their reflections. Um, so our market, you know, our market research shows that open stack's reputation, you know, it's, it's powerful, it's flexible, it's, it's, you know, for some mentioned that it's difficult to use, it's complex, but its favorability is on par with the other major players. And, um, and the more it's able to publicize itself, the better, uh, that favorability is. Um, that I, the ideal for a foundation, the ideal foundation is again to curate these projects, to provide guidance, to navigate open source. Open source has to be the North Star. We have to double down. We have to wrap up open source or open stack foundation um, around open source. Uh, and then the, the, the three strategic openings that we see is there's potential here to start with the summit by broadening this foundation scope to be inclusive to new projects around open open infrastructure. Um, you know that one that one slide where you saw 32% just without even this existing a third. You know that was a top, um, you know, summit they'd be interested in attending. Doesn't even exist, and it's you know 16 percentage points higher than Open Tech Summit. Um, I think that's compelling. I think that is a a, a potential strategic opening that the foundation should explore. Um, second, you know, this idea of articulating the vision. People think that open source foundations are good, but they don't. They have a very muddled sense of what they actually should be doing. Um, so the more we can articulate uh, and be explicit about that vision, the better. And then lastly, uh, elevating new projects um, and welcoming new communities into the fold, thinking about that market trends, tech trends uh, slide and thinking about, okay, well, these are where it's coming down the pipeline and, you know, anything that's a new project that can kind of um, make sure that the experience, once people integrate those into their workflows, those technologies and tools into their workflows, the better, because people are looking towards them as what's coming next. And it's important to um, uh, to make sure that the open tech experience uh, is inclusive and uh, welcoming. Uh, you know, folks who are working on those new uh, in those areas uh, and wanting to integrate those technologies into their workflow. So with that, um, I will pause, hand it back to Lauren, Mark, Jonathan, the open tech team, and then be here for questions. Um, I hope this was interesting. I hope this. Uh, was clear, and um, if anyone has any questions, uh, I'm more than happy to answer them in the next 10 minutes, and then also be available um, for any follow-ups. Awesome, well, thanks so much, David, and, and thanks to your team. I know that was a lot to digest in <laughs> the time that we had, so um, I did want to just open it up for any questions, but also just kind of reactions or thoughts, if there's anything that stood out to you as um, notable or surprising or anything along those lines. Um, hi, this is Annie. I just have a quick question for David. Um, I'm just curious, do you have a breakdown of the participants as, you know, who are the developers and who, who, how many of them are the developers? How many of them are business decision makers? Do you have that breakdown? Absolutely. Yeah, I went very quickly through the methodology slide. Um, we had 30% 30 per, 30 of our, um, first, everyone in our survey said that they either directly or have material influence on decision making. You know, this is a decision maker survey. So we did screen out anyone who said that they had only indirect influence, they don't influence at all. So we did try to have that as a screen. Uh, second, and I didn't mention this, we always, you know, we've been doing this for five years now, we've learned some things and we have uh, some, some kind of tech knowledge based screens. So again, make sure that we're not letting in folks like um, myself or my partner who technically, you know, we, we know about these things, but we don't, we don't know enough to, to qualify for this survey. Um, so, um, you know, you're terminated if you kind of, we have a couple of traps where if you answer like, yes, I know about this term, but it's a term that doesn't exist. We use Greenfield as a service, which is not a real thing, but if people who select that as something they know, that they're familiar with, get kicked out of our survey because they're most likely lying. Um, so we have a couple of knowledge screens. That gives you a sense of kind of like the quality participants, which I think is important. You know, these are the same panels that Gardner uses, that Forestry uses, but we want to have an enhanced screening mechanism so that we can make sure that these are like actual decision makers who are actually engaged with the tech. Um, with, uh, with respect to the role, 30% um, were ops and architects, 20% were devs and devops, 25% were IT managers, and 25% were CIO, CTO, and line of business. So we, you know, we set some quotas to try to have roughly um, a quarter to about 30% of the sample be broken down by those four bigger buckets of IT decision makers. Is that, does that answer your question? 
Yeah, sounds good. Thank you. So you mentioned a bit about how you select these folks. Um, just, uh, I guess, further back, how do you find them to begin with? I'm a little curious about that. Absolutely, and, and I probably should have spent a little more time on methodology, it sounds like, so apologies for that. Um, we use uh, the, uh, the US and, and I think now globally the largest panel provider um, out there online. This is an online survey. Um, the online panel that we use is actually recently merged the two largest panels, so that's why I think it's actually now the largest global panel provider. It's the same panel provider that Gartner uses, that Forrester uses. Um, these are folks who participate in several types of studies. Um, and we and they are, you know, they have data on these people. Um, so we basically are targeting IT professionals, and then we have our hand screening to make sure that they are knowledgeable, that they're decision makers, and that they're not just, you know, in the industry, but um, that they are. And, and again, I should mention this is not just IT industry folks. This is anyone who says that they're um, involved in IT uh, in their day to day uh, work. So this is, you know, broad-based. It's kind of sensor, it's um, manufacturing, it's anyone who's dealing with IT. At this point, it's not enough to just talk to IT professionals in the IT industry because every company is an IT company. Um, so we try to be broad-based in that sense as well. Cool, and the follow-up question is, are the uh, survey takers um, compensated in any way? So by participating in a panel, I think you earn credits. I don't know if anyone uh, kind of remembers back in the early 2000s, like e-rewards. So you earn credits by participating um, in a number of panels. Uh, it's not like we're sending out checks to every single one of these 501 participants, but they get, you know, by participating in enough panels, they earn credits so they can exchange those credits for different things. Um, so they are, uh, they're signed up to be part of a panel. The more active the panelists they are, um, the you know they they get credits but it is not like um, transactional they don't know who we are it's double blind um, and you know again we try to do we do other traps as well so you have folks who are just on here and just clicking like straight lining through a survey to get done as fast as possible so that they can um, gain more and more credits we do a speeder trap where anyone who is you know within two standard deviations of the average amount of time taken is automatically kicked out we don't even look at their data we just assume that those people are, are cheating um, and then we also have some traps throughout the survey like I mentioned we ask them to like okay, how well do you know this thing which is actually not a real thing and then we, we, we terminate them because we know that they are not actually reading the questions so we want to keep a very high quality um, cool. so I think you said this um, I just need to clarify the OpenSec Foundation doesn't pay these people directly to answer an OpenSec survey. It's more like a... No, they have no idea. That, so that's also why we structure the survey so that all the OpenSec questions are at the very end. And in fact, we do some masking in, in, our, in our question text where we say like, um, this survey is a survey, broadcast survey all across the world. You know, in every survey, there's focus on one, um, on one company or one foundation. And then it like kind of like has like a space space, you know, in this survey, and then we have like in big bold letters as if it was just like plopped in, like a randomized. In this survey, we're focusing on open tech foundations. So we do some masking as well. And we put those specific open tech and open tech foundation questions all towards the back um, after the market, you know, after the, the market trend data, after ideal foundation data, after the capability, which as you saw has a bunch of different questions, so it wouldn't be influenced. So they don't know, they just know they're taking a panel survey. Uh, they don't know even ClearPath's name. Um, it's double blind in that sense as well. Um, and then at the end, they just assume that they got randomly selected open stack as their follow-up deep dive questions. We try to do these things to make this as um, you know unbiased as possible. Obviously, um, we do as much as we can around that sense. Right. At the end of the survey, are there inklings that they have like, huh, I wonder if this open stack was part of like paying for the survey? Maybe, but we do as much as we possibly can to make them not think that. And certainly yeah, that's formal. One final, final question. That's, that all sounds great. One final question is, do uh, are people allowed to go back in the survey once they kind of reach the end and change their answers? That is a great question, and they are not allowed to go back. Thank you. Okay. And in fact, if they don't want to, if they want to go back and they try to go back, then they actually, we, they just um, aren't incomplete. And we call them like just like a log off um, because we don't want them to change their mind. Good. Thank you. Prakash here. I have a question. Uh, just wanted mm -hmm. to find out if there a possibility of uh, correlating between the leading projects like Zool, Starling X, Kata, and uh, Airship, which you mentioned. Uh, that uh, if we can correlate that, 
with the uh, what do you call the uh, how people are using uh, in future next year certain areas uh, so is there any sure so like that the two? slide where i said the market trends like the technology coming down the pipe and then <laughs> correlating that with people who think it's more favorable to, it, it, that they're Yes, absolutely. That it's interesting. That's an that would be an interesting cut, and we'd be happy to provide that to you. I think I would be if I I probably can't do that in two minutes. Um, I want to think about it. I need to like run the cross tabulation. Um, but that's something we can provide for you. Sure, that's an interesting. Yeah, question. we we would like to have that to know whether the projects that are there in the pipeline are they making sense for the future? What trends are indicating? Thank it makes total sense to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I think we're at the end of our, our time just about here and wanted to make sure that we got everyone's questions in and, and just talked about, about next steps. Are there any other last questions before we, we talk about next steps? I, I do have a one more question. Um, I don't know if we can um, answer it um, here. But my, my question is, um, which I did not really get from this presentation is, um, obviously OpenStack brand is very good, it's very important, but if we are going with the open infrastructure route, is that gonna make it, create any impact on the OpenStack brand? Is it gonna be a negative impact or positive impact? I, I, I mean, I, I don't know if OpenStack folks you wanna mention, I, I could just, I would like to just reemphasize in the survey, we did, you know, test open infrastructure summit. And again, I want to point out, you know, our market, right? China really has a strong fear really towards open stack itself as technology. Yet they were incredibly interested in open infra summit. Um, it suggests to me like it's only something that is additive uh, based on the data. Uh, we also, again, you look at the same question that Prakash uh, asked about the different projects that you have people who would definitely consider open stack. Um, but aren't considering the other uh, projects and vice versa. The people who are considering the other projects and not open tech. So it feels like we can bring those people in. So I don't, you know, we didn't see any blowback um, necessarily. Uh, yeah, I think, and, David, I, I yeah, should sorry, jump in and, and just uh, clarify because I, I think we were con possibly conflating a couple of, couple of different potential options that, that are on the table. Um, one is around the summit itself. And I think that, um, that, the data supports the, the notion that if we are to rebrand the summit, um, we could, we, it actually gives us the opportunity to emphasize each of the projects, including and especially OpenStack as part of the summit. So I think that, that um, the data supports the, the idea that if we change the name of the summit, it wouldn't um, damage the OpenStack brand. I think the second question um, is more around changing the name of the foundation. I think to me, um, you know, that's potentially a trickier question and, and maybe the data is not, not giving us as clear of a signal on that. So I, I think that it's important to kind of, you know, separate those, those two things. And, and most of what we've been talking about in, the, in this presentation and around sort of what the data is pointing to is about the summit itself, and, and, it, and part of the thinking around that as well, Annie, is that if you look at what the summit um, is, it's, it's actually already bigger than not just OpenStack, but actually has, has for many years extended beyond just the projects hosted at the foundation. So even, even when you talk about having, you know, Starling X, Kata, Zool, and OpenStack at the summit, you're still going to have things that aren't part of the foundation hosted projects, right? Where there's tons of you know, sessions on Kubernetes and Docker and TensorFlow and on and on. So I think in that sense, it, it's, it, it wouldn't be, um, I think, you know, uh, going to cause any concern around uh, looking like the OpenStack brand is something we're abandoning because it would be very much embedded in how we talk about the Open Infrastructure Summit. Versus, like I said, you know, if we were to actually change the foundation name, that potentially is a different, it's a much different scenario in my mind. Um, and, and just lastly, I'll, I'll mention that we, um, in the past week, have just kind of um, reached out to all of the sponsors of the last two summits and, and asked um, informally, basically, hey, uh, if we were to change the name of the summit next year in 2019, you know, would you sort of be... Uh, for, against, or neutral, and I think um, every single person we talked to um, 
was either in favor, which was the vast majority, or sort of neutral. Uh, I don't think we got a single company that came back and said that's a bad idea. So that's just another data point, um, and we're still getting that feedback coming in. But um, in terms of the summit side, I think that we can do that, in my opinion, in a way that doesn't um, damage or kind of put the OpenStack brand at risk. Great, thank you. Yeah. And I know that we're over time now. Um, obviously, there's a lot of information here um, and a lot of different ways that we can look at it and that we're going to be applying this. So we'll definitely be sharing you know, more of how we are planning to weave some of these insights into our messaging as we're heading into the, the Berlin Summit and announcements that happen around that, um, as well as you know, a lot of the content that we're continuing to produce. But we'll definitely be sharing more, more of this data um, throughout the rest of the year. And if you have any specific questions or you know, a specific interest around it, please let us know and we'll, we'll try to pull together information to help answer those questions. Awesome. Well, thank you all for your time. We really appreciate it. Um, and like I said, if you have any questions, please shoot them over and we will share this recording and the slides uh, as soon as it's available. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. And especially ClearPath for uh, everything you've done to, to pull this data together and do all the research. Very, very valuable. Fantastic. And we'll do the follow-up. And any other questions, we're happy to be available. Um, our work does not stop. If you have any questions about data, we're happy to answer. Thanks.